Hello, my name is Yuri. I have a psychology degree, master's degree from Aarhus University in Denmark. And I like to read a lot of psychology and psychology articles. So I figured I could uh, make some YouTube videos about it too. Uh, for people who maybe cannot read or stuff like that, I don't know. This is an article by Linda S. Gottfriedson. It's written in, let's see, the year 1998. So it's a bit old, but um, this intelligent science, it's something we have done in for 100 years in psychology, is the most, uh, it's actually the most advanced science in psychology today. It's the, it's the area we do most research in, and it's the area that we have the best res uh, results in, and most significant results in. So we know a lot about intelligence. One of the most interesting uh, subjects in psychology. So Linda S. Gottsgrenson uh, is really popular in this, uh, in this area. She's uh, doing a lot of interviews. You can also find her on YouTube and stuff like that with uh, in different documentaries. So highly recommended to check her out if you are interested in uh, this subject. So let's see what she writes. She says it's a, it's a very, um, it's a very discussed subject, very controversial subject, but and there's a clash between deeply felt ideals and stubborn reality. But she also says that uh, the reality is that modern nature is not egalitarian. So she's saying there's a lot of conflict, but some of this conflict could be because of wishful thinking sometimes. You wish all people were equal, you wish all people were exactly the same, but there can be some variability in height or intelligence or skin color, stuff like that. And she says there's a, with all these tests we have found out, there's clearly a global factor and um, we call it the, the G factor, a general factor or the general intelligence factor. So that's pretty much what we uh, call intelligence today. Yeah, that's what she writes here. Most intelligence experts now use G as the working definition of intelligence. So when you say intelligence and you're talking to someone who studies psychology or someone who have read psychology at the university, he will think, hey, that's G factor. You're talking about G factor because that's the intelligence we, we have found that we can study. And the other kind of intelligences are philosophical subjects that are kind of like, um, Mm, yeah, it's something we can imagine and something we can hope is there, but maybe it's not there. We, we have not found it. And you can do a lot of different tests to find the G factor, the general factor that makes your brain thinks, think fast. Uh, you can do verbal tests, you can do writing tests, you can do figure tests, you can do math tests, you can do memory tests. All these different kind of tests, they correlate with each other. And the, this uh, correlation, that's what we call G-factor. So if your G-factor is high, you will get high scores on all these tests. And if your G-factor is low, you will have low scores on all these tests. But there could be slight variation from test to test. For example, of course, if you, if you don't have uh, eyes, then you will have a really hard time doing some uh, visual tests, right? And stuff like that. So there can be some variability from test to test. But there's a huge correlation between the test two. Let's see, it's a very short article. Oh. Yeah, it doesn't matter how you do the test. You can do it in a billion different ways. You still measure the intelligence. Intelligence can be best described as the ability to deal with cognitive complexity. And yes, that's true, of course. Uh, cognitive complexity, let's zoom in a bit. Cognitive complexity, that's uh, and solving that, that's intelligence. Or smarts, reasoning, problem solving, abstract thinking, quick learning. Also, G factor, something in your brain that makes you smart. Oh, a person's store of knowledge also correlates with G level. So, how can that be? How can the amount of words you know correlate with your G-factor that is inborn and something you're born with 
That's because if you're very intelligent, then you will have, you will uh, learn more words in your life. So that's a funny correlation. Oh, this is a great example. I really like this article, especially because of these three pictures. Because usually when you read articles about intelligence, uh, you won't find that many uh, pictures or illustrations of how we measure it. But these, these tests are exactly how we can measure it. You can measure it in a billion different ways, but these three ways are great examples. You can actually do a, a test with only these kind of figures and it will uh, correlate very highly with G-Factor. Or you can do numbers test or these analogies test and again, high, high, high correlation with G-Factor. Uh, but there's also people like um, Gardner who say that that can be maybe there are more than one intelligence uh, but what Gartner says is that his different versions of intelligence cannot be measured so they are something he thinks of but there's no science that can measure them that's what he is saying and also we have found out that some of his factors actually have the g-factor in them so if you're good at one thing then you will be good at the other thing too for example if you're good at English you're also good at maths there's a correlation there. Oh yeah. Uh, brain size correlates with the um, IQ. Yes, of course, logically. And also uh, brains of people. Uh, if you have a high IQ, you will, lose, you will use less energy to solve problems. We can do some scannings on your brain while you solve problems. So we can see how hard you work, how many centers in your brain are activated. And we can see that if you uh, present problems to very intelligent people, they will, uh, their brain will be less activated. So they need less of their brain to solve these kind of problems. That's like if you're really, really strong and you are lifting some, some stuff, then you will need, um, it will feel easier for you to lift this, um, this thing, right? Because you have, you have a lot of muscles or big muscles. It's the same way here. You work less. And something brain waves correlate strongly with IQ. Oh yeah, uh, IQ can be uh, or G, the G factor can be the speed of processing or uh, efficiency of neural processing. There's also, we can actually measure IQ with the reaction time test. So there's some button that, that lights up and you need, to, uh, you need to push them as fast as possible. And this very, very simple test that you can do in a few seconds um, is actually highly correlated with IQ because you still need, you need to solve it really, really fast. Oh yeah. Here she writes that her ability of IQ rises with age. What does that mean? It means when you are in a preschooler, then your parents influence your IQ, right? And also environment and stuff like that. So only 40% of your, of your IQ is heritability. But then uh, when you're adolescent, then 60% of your IQ is heritability. And when you are a late adult, then 80% of your IQ is heritability. And the parental influence that have been an effect on your childhood it has gone away uh, totally so parents and, and uh, different uh, educational settings and stuff like that can influence your IQ but only when you're very young and when you are the adult then your IQ will become what you have what you are born with as she says here environments shared by siblings have little to do with IQ of course, the environment you share with different people have uh, cannot really influence uh, your IQ. So if you have if we have some educational programs or stuff like that, or tell parents to teach you a certain way or do s certain stuff for you, that can influence the IQ, but only short term. And she's also saying uh, that when you measure different races, there's no like uh, cultural variability. 
So if you have a low IQ, you have a low IQ. That's that's what the test measure. There's no cultural bias. I really like this graph because um, you have a high uh, IQ on the right side, you have low IQ on the left side, and you can see that if you have low IQ, there's a higher chance that you will be divorced in five years time or that you are unemployed or you have illegitimate children or you live in poverty or you have been in prison or you are a high school dropout so you can see if you're really really um, if you are really low intelligence and hard time getting a job or living by yourself then you have a, a huge chance to drop out of high school and if you're a high intelligence individual you have a pretty much zero percent chance of dropping out of high school So higher also unemployment rates and of course because if you're on a high IQ individual and this is of course group effects not for one single person but you can pretty much take all jobs in the world um, if you are very high IQ and if you are on a low IQ um, you need slow supervised jobs so yeah you're pretty much out of the job market if you have an IQ lower than 75 and even if you have an IQ of 85, you can only do menial tasks. So still it's really hard for you to, to get a good education. And even if you have an average IQ of 100, there's some jobs you cannot do in the modern society. And maybe that these uh, things will be, uh, will, will show themselves more in the future because if we get self-driving cars, if we get uh, robots to serve food for us and stuff like that, that's actually uh, jobs that individuals with IQ of uh, 85 do. So they will have to find some other jobs to do. Um, in the military, it's super, super popular to uh, do IQ tests and also um, see what kind of um, man you need to be a good soldier. They have found out that they do not want to take individuals with an IQ of less than 85, I think this USA military. So if you have a low IQ, they, you cannot even join the army. And that's because you, while the tasks are maybe not always complicated, you still need to do some menial tasks. And if you have a very low IQ, you will even have a hard time doing some menial tasks. This is what the, she's writing here. There's a lot of testing and pretty much all of the, this stuff like rifle assembly, monitoring signals, complex plotting, all this stuff, it will be really hard for you to have if you have a low IQ. And also general mental ability, of course, predicts job performance. And it has a high predictability power of job performance. And she's saying that it uh, it's actually uh, has a higher predictability power than education or experience on the job. So if I measure your IQ, or even if you just measure your parents' IQ, biological parents' IQ, and you have never met them, I can predict uh, with some certainty your, your job status and your wages and stuff like that, and how well you will perform at your future job. Yeah, she says, yeah, low, I, low IQ women are four, my, four times more likely to bear illegitimate children. And eight times more likely to become a chronic welfare recipient compared to higher IQ women. More, much more likely to become divorced too, of course. And she's saying here that exactly what I said before, that if you have an IQ of less than uh, 75, you have a really hard time finding a job. You will even have a hard time living by yourself. And what I'm, I'm proposing, that's just my hypothesis, I'm just philosophizing a bit, that's if, if you have an IQ of 85 and uh, you cannot uh, attend college because you have a really hard time studying at that level, you will also have a hard time finding jobs in a 20 years time or 30 years time when we have robots doing more and more tasks. Yes, and she, of course she's ending it by saying that the IQ remains unchanged 
and uh, all the different stuff we have tried with the educational programs, uh, teaching parents to raise their kids a certain way, uh, trying to influence in a different way, using computers, stuff like that. On these, uh, all these programs have shown no effect. They can show an effect in an early age, but that effect goes totally away when you grow up. So it seems to be her very much heritable. Yeah, it's too bad, but there's no real pro there's no thing you can do to to raise your IQ. No program at all. No book will uh, teach you to become more intelligent this way. Yes, and a bit about her. I actually like this article. It's a bit short. Uh, there's no so much. It's uh, written in uh, ninety eight. Not so much on IQ correlation with health factors, for example, mental and physical health. If you have a higher IQ, you also have higher mental and physical health compared to low IQ individuals. There is also some lead effects we have actually found, and there's a small effect. So if you have um, a lot of lead in your environment, when you grow up, your IQ would, uh, on average, be a bit lower. And there's a lot of stuff we have found like this, and also there's many, many more correlations. So she could have made this uh, list much, much longer. But I think this article is for beginners. So if you want to know, hey, what do scientists think about intelligence? Then this is how we measure intelligence. This is what, how we understand intelligence. And as she writes, there are some philosophers that say that maybe there are a lot more to intelligence than we can ever find out because uh, it's impossible to measure it in any kind of way. So uh, yeah, but as someone who likes uh, like science, I think this is uh, this is our modern idea of intelligence, and I would recommend you read this article because it's a great introduction. Thank you.